Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. This is our weekly two cents segment. We're on a mission to become Australia's most trusted property podcast. I'm smiling because today I'm being joined by the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Mr. Owen Rusk. Owen, uh, it's um, great to have you on your own show. So uh, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I, f- I feel like it's it's yours, uh, Chris's and Amy's. And uh, I'm, I just make up the space, babe, but I'm stoked to be here. So thanks for having me on again. Yeah, super sub this week. Chris is over in Fiji um, enjoying a beach holiday. So uh, Owen steps in this week. So uh, thanks for joining everyone. Every Sunday morning at 7 a.m., you'll find our Two Cents podcast episode waiting for you in your favourite podcast player. And um, usually in these episodes, Owen, we just go through the big three property news stories of the week. And also if people have any questions, uh, we try to cover a few of those as well. So as always, send in your questions. Um, So Owen, uh, I guess last uh, week or so, you've been um, busy with the the Rask Roadshow, Adelaide, Perth. How, how's it all going? Yeah, good, mate. We're just chatting off air. Um, so these, are, for those that don't know, uh, we're doing a ten part national roadshow. Uh, Pete's coming to a few of them. Chris is coming to a few. Amy's coming to one in Sydney, uh, and the whole uh, basically network gets together and, and comes along to select events. And mate, it's been great. Like Perth sold out, Adelaide sold out. I think we got about one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy in perth um and then in adelaide we had about 130 i would say 140 and both events are great i mean it was so good to get over to perth because it's really humbling for me right like i i get to go over there with the team and um meet people and they've listened to us for years and it's just a really really lovely night and you know we put on some drinks and some food and people ask their questions and it's just so lovely because a lot of people i guess don't realize this, but you and I, Pete, uh, everyone else that you know hosts a podcast, we, we spend most of our time looking into a camera or looking into a microphone and we don't get a chance to come out and meet everyone and it's just so lovely to do that. So um, that was great. And um, I know you also ask for a personal anecdote uh, each week So because I am a listener and uh, this week I did buy another puppy so or second dog and that has kept my plate full between travel and the puppy. It's a, it's a lot, mate, but what have you been working on? Doesn't that make uh, travel a bit harder when you've got pets? I've always shied away from it because I do travel a fair amount, not least for mm. the Rask Roadshow because I've got four <laughs> events coming up, Newcastle, Port Macquarie, Wangaratta and Sydney. Um, but, yeah, I always wonder if you've got a puppy or a cat, how do, how do you actually fit in things like travel? Because there's somebody who spends a fair amount of time overseas, it always seems impossible to me. Well, it might be easier for someone like you who lives in a beautiful part of the world here in Australia, but there's a, there's a website called uh, Trusted House Sitters, and it's kind of like the Airbnb for pet sitting and house sitting. And people on there get reviews, they get rated, whether they're a sitter or a property owner. And you can put up if you have pets as well, like what kind of pets they are, and then you can get applications. And it's great for people that stay at your house because they get free rent effectively. Um, and you can see their full review and history. And I've done that before. So when I needed to do that, when I needed to stay somewhere, um, I would look on trusted house sitters and I would do that. But for me, it's a little bit different because most of my travel is not like yours. It's short term. So we kind of just sometimes split up the animals. Like we have um, six birds as well and a rabbit. So it's a, it's a farm and it's not fit for everyone to run. It's not like the zookeeper's wife or whatever um, is, is, is in the area. So, um, so that's how we make it, make it work. But for anyone that does plan to go to Europe or overseas for a little while, uh, trustedhousesitters.com is a great resource um, and it's great for traveling too. It saves money. But you never thought tuning into this week's two cents, you'd get some uh, travel and pets tips. I've actually <laughs> got a couple of good friends who do dog sitting, and uh, but uh, they're experts in dealing with dogs, not really my thing. So, yeah, uh, 
Fair yes. enough. Certainly, um, Sunshine Beach, is, there's too many dogs, in my opinion. But anyway, let's not get off topic. <laughs> um, right, the big three uh, news stories of this week. So firstly, um, got a bit of uh, data out from CoreLogic and their monthly chart pack. I think the thing that stood out there is um, Melbourne's rental shortage has uh, got, got a little bit worse again over recent months. And I guess a lot of people are asking, well, what happens with changes to rent controls potentially. We've got a new land tax coming in uh, from the 1st of January next year. So we'll take a look at that. Secondly, Westpac has updated their dwelling price forecast. So you may remember uh, 2022, Westpac was forecasting 18% nominal price declines for Sydney. Same for Melbourne. Well, suddenly that's all turned around and now it's price growth this year, next year, 2025. So we'll take a look at some of those numbers and what they all mean. And then thirdly, uh, there's actually a couple of interesting articles in the Fin Review this week on intergenerational wealth transfer. A couple of very interesting pieces there, which I think is quite a big topic. Uh, Owen, mm. I'd like to explore some of your thoughts on that. Um, so, mm. well, let's kick off. Uh, let's kick off with a Victorian story. So, um, lots happening down there. I saw uh, Disneyland is potentially coming to Melbourne. I saw in the news this morning and. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of uh, sort of articles about is Melbourne the most livable city anymore and all these kind of things. Uh, CoreLogic said then that Melbourne's vacancy rate a year ago was 1.7%. Now it's down to 0.8% and it seems to be trending lower. Rents are up about 13% over the year. I guess why this caught my eye, Owen, is um, there's been quite a lot of pushback against landlords, various policies coming in. Uh, from the 1st of January 2024, there's an expanded land tax for landlords. So uh, changes to the thresholds, changes to the rates. Mm. And also there's been some talk about rent control. So I'm just wondering whether some landlords or prospective landlords are looking interstate and maybe some existing landlords are selling. Are you seeing anything like that down in Victoria, some challenges in the rental market? Well, I've definitely heard, just anecdotally speaking with people, that um, there seems to be a more, I don't know, there's more reluctance in the market, I would say, from people that I speak to around property uh, and resi property in particular, not so much commercial property. Um, people thinking, well, maybe now is the opportunity for me to look at deleveraging and exploring other asset classes because I kind of bridge both of those worlds. That's what I'm seeing more so than probably any time in the past five years. What's What I thought was particularly interesting about this data that you sent through, Pete, was that the gross yield on these properties isn't significantly different. So I expected to see some cyber figures here that showed maybe the yield was the like gross yield being more significant because of the rate rises, because we talk about um, landlords being price setters in effect and the ability to pass on the increased costs to their, you know, to their tenants. Um, and I I guess in the data, I expected to see a bigger shift here. It's gone from 3.3% 12 months ago to 3.8% nationally. Um, and that was quite surprising to me. And that kind of ties in with the the anecdotes that I have around people kind of feeling the pinch, like the, the landlords feeling the pinch. So I guess the, the concern amongst people, much like super, which we'll talk to at the, in the third talking point, um, from my perspective, is how much is this going to keep changing. So we know what's on the table now, but what happens in two or three years from now? Um, and I think I would say it's the first time people are actively coming to me saying, I need to look at other al alternatives. Like I need to look at that right now. Um, but that's from my perspective. It's kind of like a micro perspective. Curious to hear, obviously you're the expert in the room here, Pete. Curious to hear your thoughts. Certainly something that Chris was talking about last week is uh, talking to clients who are particularly portfolio investors and where people have bought multiple mm. properties in the past. People are looking to offload often their least preferred or their worst performing property. And I think there's been plenty of data out actually to show that the number or the percentage of dwellings for sale accounted for by investors or implied rental properties is definitely higher than it normally is. So for sure, this is playing out in the market. Now, I guess the figures show that the stock is generally being absorbed at the moment. So listings are still overall about 25, 26% lower than would be normal for this time of year, but definitely more landlords exiting. And um, yeah, on the, the gross yields point, we'll generally tend to find that yields actually follow interest rates. Uh, 
you know, if interest rates fall, then yields tend to fall and vice versa. Um, so yields have increased. But yes, I mean, I think holding costs have gone up more than rents overall. Mm. And um, this this is probably, I think, with mortgage rates going up and especially on investor loans, that there'll be plenty of people who were quite comfortable when mortgage rates were so much lower, but now they're finding they'd probably try to deleverage, um, take some of the risk off the table. Uh, so mm. not to be unexpected, I suppose. Do you know, this is it, because we'll talk about price increases and these types of things in a minute, but just on this rental question in particular, the investor income piece, so to speak, do we find in those less desirable or would you expect to find in those less desirable properties that Chris was referring to, would you expect them to be regional uh, type holdings, maybe coastal type holdings? We did do a piece on this. Um, a week or two ago, and it, it did seem that where the listings have increased the most, it's generally been uh, what you might call a secondary market or uh, mm. regional markets, especially across southeast Queensland and other parts of Queensland. So generally areas where people might have been investing with a cash flow focus and properties that might have been cash flow positive previously, but now with interest rates going up, that's flipped and they're actually losing money. And uh, one of the things that Chris was saying is that people often, they're quite ha happy to hold properties that are uh, washing their face, so to speak. Mm. But um, with the cash flow uh, flipping negative in many cases, that's uh, forced more landlords out of the market. So uh, sort of areas uh, that flashed up, uh, places like Loganshire, Mackay, there's a number of markets across Queensland. So yeah, look, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but it, listings haven't increased in the blue chip areas so much. Um, lowest increases have been in places like the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Uh, so, yes, you're right. It's generally been more sort of regional and secondary markets at the moment. Anyway, I think the, mm. the core logic figures showed interesting little uh, graphic they pulled together. Growth in national rents reached 35 consecutive months in July, which is the longest stretch since 2013. And cumulatively, rents are up about 30% um, over those 35 months or so nationally. Now, of course, there's different markets within markets. But it did seem to me that the actual pace of growth is now tapering off. There is a, a limit to how far rents can go, I think, before people start pushing back or looking at other alternatives, staying with parents or uh, potentially flat sharing and things like that. So, I mean, that's probably good news from an inflation perspective, but it does seem that this sort of boom in rents will eventually run out of steam or at the very least taper off, I guess. Mm. And that's what the, the data for the quarterly versus annualised figures seems to suggest, doesn't it? That we're, the, the quarterly figures, the way they're annualising, looks similar to what we're seeing over 12 months in, in line with that. Um, interestingly, one of the pieces of data from the 12 months change in rental rates was the decline of houses in Canberra. I thought that was like the anomaly, the one that went backwards. Um, I thought that was curious for anyone that's in, in Canberra if you're looking for a rental. I don't know what the commute is from Sydney, but um, yeah, it, it's it's probably a reversal I didn't expect to see. Vacancy rates are up quite significantly uh, in Canberra and Hobart. I guess if you look at the other capital cities, particularly the, mm. the larger capital cities, vacancy rates are very low and in many cases, still falling. Um, but yes, Hobart vacancy rate now 2.7%, Canberra 2.2%. So those are markets where you might actually expect to see rents coming down. Um, now, mm. Hobart is just coming off the back of an enormous boom in prices. So that's probably not that unexpected. Canberra, a bit of a different market there, very much driven by public sector work. And um, it was mm. somewhat protected, I suppose, through COVID because everyone worked from home and kept their jobs, but uh, maybe just coming off a bit now. Mm. Here's a question for you specifically. So um, obviously you do a lot of your bidding uh, in and around Brisbane. Uh, are you still buying properties? Like are you, are, you, are, you, are your clients still looking for investment properties for any type of income or, you know, just kind of break even? They are. We've generally found when we run the numbers, so people are potentially borrowing the mortgage rates of six or sometimes even close to seven percent. So it's much, right. much harder to make the cash flow uh, stack up favorably. So a lot of the people who've been buying recently have generally been higher income earners or people with a million dollar budget. Uh, it's a little bit harder from a cash flow perspective, I suppose, with the way things mm. have they've gone with mortgage rates. But yeah, we're still buying. Um, definitely, we've seen people just taking much longer to get to the point of 
actually taking action. A lot of people have inquired and uh, doing the preliminary work, but not actually kicking off a search. But yeah, we're still uh, getting some nice property buys across across the line. Uh, I think the market is still strong in pockets. I think uh, certain properties are performing well, largely because there's just a dearth of stock. I think this is mm. the, the trend that's been ongoing for quite some time. It's difficult to find quality stock out there. And that's not just the Brisbane issue. It's been happening all around the country. Mm. Mm. So uh, I guess there's one final question for this one, which is like, if you're listening to this, maybe you're thinking, maybe you're in Melbourne like I am or elsewhere and you're seeing rents go up reasonably well um, over the past 12 months, but probably not enough to keep pace with the rate rises. Um, does that prompt people into a, a, a change of tact? Is it, or is it too late or too early to think about that? I think generally speaking, if you're looking at an investment property, I think people get way too focused on what's going to happen next week or next month. I think most often I've found that investment property tends to work well as a 10 or 15 year investment or ideally longer in a lot of cases. And if you look at where market pricing is now for the terminal cash rate, well, it's more or less where we are. So, of course, yeah. we might still get another hike. That can easily happen. But I think um, if you're looking uh, two or three years out, I mean, CBA is predicting 100 basis points of easing next year. This is all conjecture, of course. Nobody really knows. But um, if you're looking to take a longer term view, um, you don't need to worry quite so much about what's going to happen over the next week or month. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people can get very short term focused on this stuff and focused on media headlines rather than looking at fundamentals and, and taking a longer term perspective. Which is why we love to hear from you on the, the podcast every every Sunday, Pete, and uh, also on Twitter. For those of you that don't follow Pete on Twitter uh, easily, the best to follow on Twitter for Aussie property. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's the case in point is the uh, social media is actually sort of encouraged more and more short-term thinking because we log mm -hmm. on every morning to see what's happening. I saw this morning CBA re reporting its full year results and everybody analyzing is the stock going to be up or down and I guess mm. um, online media has certainly encouraged uh, more sort of clickbait stories, but now with social media, it's very rapid fire and difficult sometimes to, to tune out from the noise and actually take those longer term views uh, with mm. the sort of the abundance of information. It's a blessing and a curse, I suppose. It is. I find that um, it's really good not to get in that echo chamber, right? We tend to follow people on social media, oh, um, whether, whether it's property or investing, that it that conform to our worldview. But I deliberately seek out people that I disagree with often, but have an informed opinion for the very thing, reason that you're talking about, which is like, I might not agree with that person, but I'll still follow them to get their insights because I've got to understand or try to understand their perspective. And that's what makes the market at the end of the day, doesn't matter what we believe. But this is actually a good segue into the next topic, Pete, you mentioned conjecture. And you, you, you started off at the top of the show by saying that Westpac came out last year. It was almost a year to the day Westpac comes out, updated their prices and said, uh, their forecast and said maybe dwelling prices are going to fall this year we've probably got the opposite rhetoric um the opposite conjecture if you will saying that prices may rise particularly in sydney which is quite interesting and probably alarming for a lot of people that are looking to buy uh in and around sydney but it maybe makes sense with some of the inventory levels that we're seeing um i guess maybe one of the things we can talk about as well is the the difficulty in forecasting but what did you make of this it's a bit of a cheat, really. West Bank are forecasting uh, house price rises despite interest rate increases. Sydney to be up 10% in 2023, followed by 6% in 2024, 4% in 2025. And similar kind of results, a bit lower price growth in Melbourne. Brisbane to do 6%, then 4%, and then 3%, and then Perth probably up there with Sydney. Mm -hmm. I think, though, this is a bit of a cheat because prices in Sydney are already up 7 or 8% this yeah. year to date. So forecasting a 10% increase over the calendar year, well, it's already happened to some degree. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, people can get too bogged down in some of these uh, sort of debates about nominal price declines and real price declines because, of course, you're buying a property, not not the whole market. Um, mm. yeah, I mean, I, I like to follow on the social media, some of the heterodox economists and you know, to get new perspectives and new ideas that you might not have thought about. But property in particular is a very polarizing subject and you mm. tend to get people divided up into camps as sort of, uh, you get sort of bulls who are sort of uh, portfolio property investors and then bears who are generally 
people who rent and invest in the stock market and then yeah some homeowners who have some superannuation and stocks and they're somewhere in between the two camps usually um but yeah it's amazing how people are influenced by their worldview on this type of stuff uh yes mm. you're right westpac a, a year ago very bearish nominal price declines forecast in the big cities of 18 percent. well it just hasn't happened um and that mm. goes back to your point it's very very difficult to forecast this stuff population growth is currently running well if you look at the population clock um, an extra person every 46 seconds well <laughs> you know that's nearly seven hundred thousand a year it can't possibly be sustained at that level but it uh, no, nobody was predicting this stuff a year ago and um, i guess there's a bit of a mea culpa here because uh, some smart ass on uh, social media dug up a uh, video that i spoke at uh, the pepperstone <laughs> event about a year ago and uh, i don't even remember the discussion but i was there with bob carr and stephen kukulis and i was saying i didn't think the cash rate would get above 3.1 percent <laughs> in august 2023 and then uh as I said, some smart aleck uh, picked it up. And here we are, August 2023, and it's 4.1. So that's going to cost me a bottle of wine. Well, I was going to say, yeah, it looked like a bottle of Grange too, which I'm... <laughs> that's 400 <laughs> bucks. I, yeah, well, um, I'll have to go down to uh, Canberra and see the Kook and uh, and uh, enjoy a bottle of Shiraz with him. Or a bottle of Grange. injury. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I guess it goes back. I mean, it, I suppose the only thing I can say in my defence is that the Reserve Bank governor was forecasting a cash rate of zero. So I guess uh, uh, 3.1 seemed, seemed a long way away. But of course, we've had, well, there's been any number of things that have changed, not least the, the war in Ukraine, which has added mm. to um, inflation pressures around the world. But yeah, it goes back to the point. It's very, very difficult to anticipate this stuff. And uh, I think you can tie yourself in knots trying to uh, sort of debate, you know, these sort of minutiae of where prices mm. might go on an index. But in the end, as a participant in the housing market, you're buying individual properties and you need to focus a bit more on uh, sort of staying in your lane and taking a longer term view. Can I ask you just to play a bit of a hypothetical here for me, Kate? Okay, let's say, okay, we know that probably Westpac was wrong last year, but let's say for argument's sake that they're right now. If they're right about, what was it, uh, 10%, 6%, 4%, what would be the drivers of that? You mentioned immigration. I saw in the data that the net, because I think it was Chalmers was talking about, it's net immigration, guys. That means that some people should be leaving, but they're not leaving. They're staying here. So we're seeing more immigration or more like population growth. Can you... Can you imagine if you were at Westpac, what would be the drivers to make that happen? Uh, more buyers than sellers. <laughs> Can I yeah. say that? Supply yeah. and well, demand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that I think the thing when it comes to property is there's a lot of people who buy with no mortgage at all. So you'll get mm. um, cash buyers, people who've sold another property um, and they're looking to buy. You get people who are downsizing. So it's not all driven by interest rates. Um, what mm. really changes quicker than anything else is sentiment. Now, Westpac released their consumer sentiment figures for August. Consumer sentiment is very low. It's, it's mired in sort of recessionary levels. Mm. And if you look at the moment, the time to buy a dwelling index, although the index is down about 8% from a year ago. So most people at the moment are not really thinking it's a great time to buy. Interestingly, house price expectations have continued to rise, but most people are just very cautious about mortgage rates. Um, but if prices are to rise, it's usually because sentiment changes and the number of people in the market to buy a property will generally change much more quickly than the number of sellers because it takes a lot of time to prepare a property yeah. for sale. Um, so if things were to change, yes, it's, it's generally a shortage of stock listed for sale. Uh, more immigration, uh, an underbuild expected over the next decade uh, with very high population growth forecast and just more people coming in to buy. I think people start to get a bit of a FOMO when prices go up. So that would be, those would be the drivers. Sydney Morning Herald reported this week a shortfall of at least 134,000 dwellings over the next five years amid the Albanese government's record immigration programme. New housing shortfalls in New South Wales, 134,000. So, I mean, that's just the one state. You know, there's obviously mm. uh, an issue here because the capacity of the industry to build is not really keeping pace with population growth. But there are things that could happen in the other direction too. 
I guess the interest rates are the big one. If we got a resurgence in inflation through things like oil prices, energy, uh, rents, insurance, if that starts uh, sort of arcing up again and interest rates go further towards 5% for the cash rate target, that would definitely kill uh, those projections stone dead. So a lot mm. can change, but um, that's where things are looking at the moment. Well, it's not completely out of the picture, right? Because we saw, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was New Zealand we saw in America. Like these economies, obviously it's a very different thing which you tweeted about recently, um, how few mortgages in the US are what we would call variable rates. Um, they're all like 20, 30-year fixed rates, which is incredible for someone in Australia to think about. But um, in those economies, we're seeing that central banks may not be done. At least they might spook people a little bit when they think they're done. Um, so maybe there is that there were there always is that possibility, right? Um, it was it was it was a really interesting number to me that shortfall. I think that's something that maybe people should think about a bit more. When we say shortfall, we mean there's an expectation of properties being built, but the shortfall is the the amount that they have to make up some way in order to meet expectations. So, in effect, what they're saying is based on the expectations from the government, Albanese government. We're not even at that pace, so um, that's that's pretty. I'd say, as someone who has a trivial understanding of this type of thing, I must admit, I'd say it's a pretty bullish thing for asset owners, Pete. Well, generally, yes. If you look at where the budget papers were projecting population growth to go over the next five years, it's about two point two million or thereabouts. So more than four hundred thousand. Uh, growth in the population every year over the next five years and presumably far into the future as well. At the moment, though, we're seeing a lot of builders and developers, lots of delays, lots of projects mm. being scrapped or mothballed, and we're just not really keeping pace. A part of the issue is um, we're building so much infrastructure and we've got mining projects as well. So there's a lot of competition for the labour in the construction sector and residential property is not um, really... Well, it's just not keeping pace with a rapid rebound in population. I think the your point on the fixed versus variable is very interesting. I think the, the big issue is really for the United States. The, the resilience of the economy over mm. there has just been remarkable. Still got unemployment tracking at around um, 3.5%. It's 50-year lows. You know, federal funds rate has gone from basically zero to above 5%. But yes, as you said, most people in the US will go for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So a lot of people have locked in their mortgages at much lower rates in the twos and just aren't <laughs> impacted by the rising interest rates. So they keep on spending, the economy keeps on ticking along, and it's just really frozen up the housing market. Most people aren't buying or selling. Very different dynamic in Australia, which I've always thought is really a strength rather than a weakness. The Reserve Bank can pull the levers uh, they can increase interest rates tomorrow or at least at the next meeting, and that will have an immediate impact on so many people in the economy because most people in Australia have variable rate mortgages or they're on short-term fixed rate mortgages, so it will impact them soon enough. Um, so I would always think of that as a strength rather than a weakness for Australia because the levers are much more impactful on, on a much more timely basis, whereas in the States, uh, mm. yes, it, the... the Funds rates gone from zero to five, but there's a lot of people who just aren't impacted by that. And as we know, the US economy tends to be very resilient over time and it's showing it once again. Yeah, I mean, if I was offered a 30 year mortgage in the twos, I'd probably take it to be honest. But oh, um, from one of, the, from one of the best inflation hedges you could ever get. But from a macro level, from a, a government policy level, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and there may be, I don't know, um, there may be some concern around like the inequality uh, that arises from something like that, uh, where excessive interest rate increases designed to control the economy hit those which maybe aren't asset owners uh, and, and and cause some disparity there. Okay, so this is really interesting. So I didn't, when we proposed the talking points for this week, I didn't expect um, that we would be doing the 180 with Westpac, but it makes sense, uh, as you said, because the calendar year is, we're well and truly into it. Um, the third story is very interesting which is this idea of intergenerational wealth transfer. And if you're playing along at home, I feel like this is something that 
you have probably seen in the background taking place. You've probably seen some policy changes or rhetoric. I mean, we've talked about it here on the show about, um, you know, after death, what happens and how is inequality caused and death taxes. I think you and I spoke about, Pete. This is a really interesting story. The idea of baby boomers and Gen X with a lot of money um, dying and passing that money on or designing their structures and the way they invest now to pass money on before they die. And we're talking about a huge amount of money here, right? Well, you mentioned on the previous news story there, the potential for inequality. And look, we all know people have been saying for a long time, the baby boomers, um, they're the wealthiest generation ever to have lived. Now, a lot of baby boomers would say, well, look, you, you know, we went through some hard times. Mm. A lot of them were born in the post-war generation. And Absolutely. they didn't really have the expectations of getting, in many cases, to where they've got to today. And, of course, you know, we all remember there were deep recessions, high interest rates, and, and all those things that they had to deal with. Um, but, yes, the uh, baby boomer generation um, is, at some point anyway, going to pass on all of this wealth. So um, mm. uh, McCrindle did a, a research paper or a study on this great wealth transfer. Uh, they estimate that the... Generation X, which is those of us born between 1965 and 1979, which just about captures me. Um, <laughs> the, this generation will inherit a colossal figure of three and a half trillion dollars from their parents over the next 20 years. So several trillion dollars to be transferred. Now, obviously, when they've gone into the data, there's a high skew towards Australia's wealthiest suburbs. So places like the usual suspects, Rose Bay, Vaucluse, Watson's Bay, down your way, Turak, and so on. So yes, it's not it's not going to apply right across the board. So you know, take me as a case in point. My parents separated. I'm one of a thousand kids. You know, I, my inheritance isn't going to be uh, it's going to be three fifths of not very much, as the saying goes. But some people, um, their parents are going to pass on very significant wealth. And in Australia, we don't have the significant death duties that a lot of European countries have. So it will actually lead to well, it's going to create some more distortions, and especially in the housing market, because yeah, especially. there's some people who get an early inheritance, which may be on the cards for some Gen Xs. That really helps, you know, parents getting kids onto the housing ladder. Parents are thinking about things like escape estate planning and how they can pass on their wealth. Uh, but it doesn't apply equally across the board, and it's a lot easier for people You've got parents who live in the eastern suburbs or Mossman or wherever, and not so easy for new arrivals and or people without wealthy parents. So there's a lot of things to think about here. Yeah, I this is a really interesting one, and it's just ironic that it, uh, we're recording this uh, just before midday Aussie time. Uh, this afternoon, I'm actually running a webinar on estate planning uh, with some financial planners, and uh, Jamie will be appearing. Uh, he's recording with Chris this coming week, so that an episode like that will be appearing on here on the Australian Property Podcast. But um, this is a really, really interesting thing to me because, Pete, I see a lot of people with with the lens of property applied. I see people using family trusts now to get their kids into property in a way that can protect both parties. And what I mean by that is they, and I'm not advocating for prop, uh, for trust for everyone, by the way, just as a f full disclaimer, but to speak to your advisor. But they, for example, some of these wealthier parents might have a child who is looking to enter the property market, may or may not have saved the, the deposit or what have you, but they can also be used in other ways to protect intergenerational wealth transfer because you could have, for example, the, a, a partner of that child and you want to protect that child uh, until that's a committed relationship. So they might buy it through the family trust, in which case the trust can own it. Uh, and it's a bit more of a enduring way to own property. And I've seen that come up a few times in recent years. And that was mentioned in the AFR article about parents and so on and so forth, using those types of structures around gi giving that exposure to the next generation. And in your instance, Pete, for example, these types of structures might make sense if there is a wealthier parent with multiple kids from uh, mixed families. Uh, again, where Rather than sell one property now, crystallize tax and distribute some money, uh, maybe there's a different structure that they can put in place. And I don't know, as of someone who works in the finance industry, I think from my perspective, if you're a financial planner who specializes in these matters, two, 
five, three point five trillion, or whatever you said before, of transfer wealth. That's a huge opportunity for someone that works in the industry, but also for the families and the recipients. We did previously. You and I we spoke about um, the, the the taxes on death and those types of things. So there are. It does get quite complicated here. But um, I was uh, presenting last week in Adelaide for the roadshow with with uh, Drew Meredith my co-host on the Australian Investors Podcast. And he got the, this exact question around estate planning and how much do I need and et cetera, et cetera. And there is a growing cohort of people entering retirement who will, who could potentially die with more wealth than they started retirement with. And this happens for two reasons. One, people save and save and save and save for retirement, probably over saving, to be honest. And then in retirement, they're so conservative because their income switches off and they're not, quote unquote, saving anymore, but their wealth is compounding faster and faster and faster. And so for those people, um, it's a really interesting discussion around, well, do you give some to charity? Do you liquidate early? Do you help community groups? And so on and so forth. And I think this theme, if you like, will be one of the driving conversations for our industry and the property industry over the next 10 to 20 years. I think this will be one of the major things, in my opinion, from what I see in the personal finance space. But that's my rant, Pete. That's 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 what I got. It was um, one of the triggers for the article, actually, was data released by Philanthropy Australia. And they were saying, well, mm -hmm. look, if people could hand over 5 or 10% of these um, big piles of assets that people build up in retirement, that could be really big for charitable giving in Australia. I think in terms of handing on wealth to kids for the housing market, there's there's a number of different ways you can do it. You mentioned the family trust. Sometimes people like to gift the deposit to their children. Parents can act as guarantors. I think for the more sort of enterprising parent, maybe a matching concept is good where you know, if mm -hmm. your child, I mean, it always seems wrong saying child. Quite often you're talking about 25 or 30 year olds, but <laughs> if your offspring can save some money towards a deposit, you could potentially match it. Might just stick a link in the show notes. Uh, Stuart Weems of Pro Solution mm. has done a couple of really good articles in the past on this and the sort of best and not so good ways to help your kids onto the housing ladder. I think it can get sometimes a bit messy if people are joint borrowers and so on. It usually works best in other ways. But um, I guess the really sort of big question here owen and uh, i've been listening to the audio book uh, for that book die with zero which i know is getting a lot of airtime in the financial mm. independence retire early space and yeah some really interesting uh, concepts that it brings into that book and i guess the basic point being uh, not that you literally have to die with no money but people shouldn't um necessarily be quite so conservative in their retirement years you know you'd I suppose the, the idea is don't waste all that money you've earned and save uh, squirreled away over decades. Uh, maybe use it to buy some experiences while you're still young enough to do so. And um, potentially think about handing over some money to the kids before you know, it's too late for them. Because I think, you know, if you potentially, I did actually, as part of reading this book, I did a little uh, life expectancy calculator. It's a bit morbid, <laughs> but uh, it showed out for me 84 with a potential. I think a 10% chance of living uh, to 93 or maybe a one in four chance of 93. But it's an interesting point. You know, if I was to live to 84, it's not much use handing money to my kids then, you know, for uh, getting onto the housing ladder because they'll be well into middle age. So I guess the point of Die With Zero, which the author talks about is, well, you know, maybe think about bringing forward some of those things and then actually spending the money instead of piling it up the decades into retirement. Yeah, well, um, I think it's Bill Perkins. We, we, um, I think we've tried to get him on the show on the Australian Finance Podcast. Shout a few out times, for Bill. <laughs> Bill, I know you're listening, so please uh, help us out over here. Um, but we had another interesting guest on our show, uh, um, another international kind of star of this type of thing. Uh, Oliver Berkman came on and spoke about Four Thousand Weeks, which is a book um, that basically breaks down like you have four thousand weeks in your life. How do you spend it? How do you use your time? And I think this is, goes back to what I was saying before about a lot of folks um, probably oversave for retirement and they don't realize like the amount of people that would present to a financial planner saying, hey, guys, we're a couple, we're pretty healthy, we're thinking of retiring, can we retire on $80,000 a year? Financial planner does the calculations and obviously it's all assumptions, but the amount of people that probably get to that 
is surprising. And people come away crying from those sessions. They're so emotional. They can't believe they've done it because they never thought they could do it. And they just need those numbers to back that up. And I think what we what we can see is that a lot of people probably, like we see those comfortable retirement standards online and that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of people probably don't appreciate what they have in front of them right now and the ability to use that right now, whether that's for the next generation or yourself. Um, I think Dave Gow, who we both know from Strong Money Australia, spoke about this recently about like having money and having a purpose with money, whether you're in retirement or not, and treating it like you know, you should spend it. You deserve it. And again, chatting to Drew last week, um, his number one thing for clients that come into his retirement planning practices, spend, like actually spend. Like the first five years of your retirement in particular are crucial. You're young enough, you're healthy enough, go on the riverboat cruise to the US, go and spend money and do the downsize or buy the nice car because you might have the money in 10 years for sure. But whether you don't, you have the physical health and the mental well-being and all the other circumstances is another thing. And um, it, we saw that really interesting um, data point from the article as well, which showed you know how long people will actually live. And it's getting longer every year that you look at that data, I think. So, Pete, you might even end up, there might be a 10% chance into your 90s. I reckon it might be a 20% chance in a few years. So, one of the risks to saying spend money is actually life expectancy is getting longer than we already anticipate. Uh, but there was a really interesting article that I did some um, research on before this. It was written in 2016. It's got richer on death than retirement. And uh, hopefully we can sneak that into the um, the show notes as well. And it's just about planning forward, but also realizing that you've probably done a good job. And what is the, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. And people drink. don't realize. It's a Warren Buffett yeah. quote. Oh, take is it? Okay. I think it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, well, take, that's take actually- a drink anyway. Okay, yeah, I um, I'll, I'll grab one just after this. It's 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 late morning, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. But I've got one. It's nearly midday. You can crack on. <laughs> yeah. I got one more thing uh, on this is which is the the giving pledge, which I know you're familiar with, Pete. Um, is Warren Buffett was signed up to this giving pledge by Bill Gates, and it's basically where these really rich people give away their wealth, and they agree to give away ninety nine percent when they pass away. Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's sidekick, also a fellow billionaire. Um, took a completely different approach. And instead of accumulating wealth like Warren has done, um, because he said, basically, why would I give it to a charity now when I can make it bigger and then give away more when I die? So that's that one concept. But the other one that Charlie took was, no, I want to give away my money now because I want to start helping people now. And I want to see that in action. And so if you take those two contrasting examples, here we have two people with lots of money doing totally different things, but the intent is kind of the same. And so I think for anyone listening to this who is in this camp, it's like, what are you going to value more? Um, what part of life are you in and how do you spend that money with intent? Um, I was actually looking at the final thing. I was looking at the postcodes and I was thinking, with all these postcodes giving away so much money, we should probably do a letterbox drop Pete, and um, say, hey, do you want to come? Do you need a buyer's agent or do, do, you, need, do you need some investment advice? Because uh, <laughs> I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, did that be all right? <laughs> Old school, the old uh, letterbox drop. It still happens in real estate a little bit. Yeah, I think um, yeah, Buffett's argument was well, he can you know continue compounding, and it, I think he uses his wealth as a, a measuring stick for success. Mm. Uh, but you know, he's thinking compounding his wealth. But who's to say that the the sort of uh, philanthropy today? I mean, what about the compounding impacts of that mm. on people's lives, generations? You know, more education, better health. Um, yeah, I think on the retirement point, I think one thing that people worry about is what if they if they're ill and the cost of healthcare. But of course, as the as uh, Bill Perkins points out, you can insure for that kind of stuff. And um, I think my final point there is if you if you want to travel somewhere or have an experience, I would just say do it because I've seen with a lot of clients I've coached over the years, people say, you know, I want to go camper vanning around Europe or do whatever in retirement. But when they get to that age, don't want to do it. You know, times change, mm. you get older, your sort of world shrinks as you go into retirement sometimes. So don't put off an experience you really want to do because, as you said, um, you don't want to be the richest person in the graveyard. So, um, mm. Owen, um, that's a huge subject and an interesting one. Let's uh, wrap up for this week, shall we? So uh, Ment- uh, Melbourne's rental shortage, that's just something to watch this space, really. Um, changes coming to tax, potentially rent controls, and massive population growth into Melbourne. 
Westpac's dwelling price forecast. Well, hopefully they're a bit more accurate this year than last year, but we'll <laughs> see how that plays out. And the intergenerational wealth transfer, I think that's probably a big subject that we can delve more into in other episodes, potentially looking at how parents can help their kids onto the ladder and some of the methods whereby they can do that. So um, mm. we'll put a couple of links in the show notes. If you want to ask us any questions, um, this is the lifeblood of our podcast, so do send them in. And yeah. um, Owen, anything else I've missed there? Uh, we've got a couple of jokes sent in on Twitter from oh, Ad B. Geez. says, what do you call a potato with a microphone? Um, they say a commentator. And the second one oh, from Tra- Travis was, I asked my German friend if he knew the square root of 81. He said no. Uh, you may need to Google that like I did. That's um, the worst joke I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the, there's, I'm sure there's plenty of German puns about the weather and Wetter and all of that, but let's... <laughs> Let's uh, let's uh, p- drag the microphone away from from Owen before he loses the, uh, yeah. the listener um, base. No, that's it. So, Peter, really appreciate you having me on. And uh, if you haven't already got your tickets to the Rask Road Show, come along. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. Forty dollars a ticket. You get three for two if you bring your friends. So, um, good night. Um, come ask us your questions live and, and say good day. We'd love to see you there. Yeah, that's I've missed me, all Peter. of these live events. Yeah, I mean during the COVID lockdown mm. so it really sucked not getting to see people face to face so do yeah grab a ticket looking forward to seeing you there in person and um i guess that's it for today so i'll see you back on the twitter great thanks pete thanks for having me cheers